Is it possible to beat Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist of the Roses using the worst starting deck? Well, of course it is. That's why we're here today, but let's get into exactly what that means. Unlike Forbidden Memories, which gives you completely random cards every new playthrough, in Duels of the Roses there are 17 starter decks to choose from, all of which surrounding a certain type or types of monsters. These decks always have the same cards no matter what, and the three that you are offered to start with are dependent on what you enter as your player name. But of the 17 starters, there is one that is arguably the worst. The Cruel Deck. Now, this may seem very opinionated of me to make such a bold claim, seeing as every monster type has its advantages and disadvantages. However, when it comes to the actual contents of the deck, this one has the lowest deck cost, a value assigned to each card, roughly translating to its power level, but it also has no lands and only a single power-up card, Fiend Castle. Oh, also it's mainly a fiend type deck, which only get power increased in the darkness, and for some reason get power decreased in the forest. I'm not really sure how that makes any sense. With this deck, the strongest summon that I can summon is Ushi Oni at 2150 attack. Using my one and only Fiend Castle, I can get him up to 2650, and if I'm hashtag blessed enough to be on the dark terrain, I can get it up to a whopping 3150. On the surface, this doesn't seem too bad, but keep in mind, I only have one copy of each of these cards, meaning I would have to mill my entire deck every duel which is obviously not ideal. As far as fusions go, my best bet is Metal Dragon at 1850. On Wasteland, I could get that up to a 2350. And conveniently enough, this deck also has a Cyber Commander, a kinda shitty card that has a less shitty ability. When he is face up in defense mode, he increases all of my machine monsters by 300 points, capping Metal Dragon out at 2650 if the fucking stars align. There's a few other rules that I'll get into when we come across them, but the last couple noteworthy things I wanted to mention is that one, I will obviously not be using any passwords or modifying the deck in any way, asterisk for the Bakura duel. I will not be using any reincarnation cards, though I do reincarnate mainly just out of curiosity, and I just end up using the cards that I get from the slots, so uh, it doesn't really affect anything. Also, at the time of writing this, I haven't fought Skull Knight Guy yet, so We'll put a pin in that one. And three, this video is inspired by an ongoing series that John O is doing on his channel where he beats Forbidden Memories using single type monster decks. He's a funny little Australian dude and the videos are really good. I would strongly recommend you check him out if you're interested. Anywho, let's get into this shit show. I decided to side with the Yorkists to start since we may as well get some fun out of this goddamn deck and Taya's a much easier duel than Weevil will be. Taya has mainly fairy type monsters, with her strongest being Air Knight Parshath at 1900. Her build is almost entirely normal terrain, which does not increase or decrease any monster types. There's, um, not much to say on this one. We trade blows a few times, I hit her with a couple direct attacks, vegetabilize her Air Knight Parshath, and finish her off with Metal Dragon. Easy peasy. I also decided in a couple of the later duels that I would go back and assign an MVP to every duel, and this one's gotta be Metal Dragon, mainly because no one else did anything. <laughs> Tristan is up next with his world famous Crab Walker strategy. After 20 years of playing, I still have no fucking idea what that means. Standard procedure, rush in, hit him with a 2250 neck hunter, followed by 1900 points from my main bitch, Nico Gal number two, and finally trap him in the corner with the MVP, Shadow Spectre. <laughs> Next up is Mai. And if you've played Duels of the Roses before, I trust that you know that Mai can be kind of a bitch. She's the first opponent with a primary field advantage, meaning all of her winged beast and dragon monsters get an additional 500 points just for being on the mountains, unless you can coax her onto the two strips of wasteland on the edge of the map. On top of that, her monsters are already pretty fucking strong, so it's clear from the beginning that this is gonna be a real pain in the ass. I hit her with an early Hinatama for 100 points of damage, but she claps back with her Harpy's Pet Dragon, dealing 200 points of damage and killing my Cyber Soldier. I use Fiend's Hands effect to destroy her Harpy Pet Dragon, lure her Harpy Lady onto the Wasteland by sacrificing one of my Neck Hunters, and then return the damage with a juiced up Air Eater. I also discovered that Fiend and Dragon make Kimori Dragon, but I, I don't think I ever actually used him, so I, I don't know. I take out her Harpy Sister with Air Eater, kill her Harpy Lady with Metal Dragon, and then regroup my defenses in the hopes of drawing Ushioni. See, my initial plan was just to get at least one Metal Dragon on the Wasteland, and if I could manage it, get the 300 attack bonus from Cyber Commander. But past that, I really didn't know what other options I had. <laughs> Even with a beefed up Ushioni, I could really only take on her weakest monsters. So I started ditching cards left and right, not really doing anything, and to my surprise, Neither was my. And that's when it hit me. As much as I praise Duelist of the Roses, 
The enemy AI is kind of dog shit, and I mean that in the best way. See, for some reason, the AI doesn't really act on their own initiative. They seem to almost exclusively react to what the player does, but if the player doesn't really do anything, then neither do they. <laughs> but why does that matter, and how does that benefit me? Well, at the top of the screen, there is a counter that displays the amount of turns left in the duel. It starts at 99 and works its way down once both players have gone all the way to zero. At the end of the 99 turns, whichever player has the most life points wins the duel, even if both players still have life points remaining. So if I can inflict even the smallest amount of damage to her life points, then get her AI stuck in a loop, run out the counter. Once the counter hits zero, I win and I can move on to the next opponent. This is where these two cards come in super fucking handy. Sparks, which does 50 points of damage directly to her life points, and Hinatama, which does 100. Normally, piece of shit throwaway cards, but today, a gift from God. Broken? Absolutely. Still technically a winning strat? You betcha. Look, even just getting this strategy set up is kind of a pain in the cock, so I'm counting it, all right? After barricading myself into the corner with Air Eater and Metal Dragon, I just have to run out the 76 turns and there you go. Victory has never tasted so bland. Up next, we have Mako. Mako Tsunami. <laughs> Mako's map is almost exclusively water, except for these two tiny patches of grass on two corners of the map. In a typical playthrough, my strategy is to rush to the land on his side of the map, giving my land lubber monsters a chance to take on his sea monsters. I make a break for the land with Bistro Butcher spearheading the voyage, but we are immediately intercepted by Kai... Kai Ryu Shin, whose effect... Who's God damn it. Whose effect transforms all adjacent squares into water terrain, effectively wiping out half the fucking land. I spellbind Kairiushin and sneak my air reader onto the sliver of land that is left. And then he immediately gets pile drived by one of the best fucking cards in the game, Aqua Dragon, whose effect transforms every square of land he battles on into water. And then, with the addition of Aqua Chorus, I. I pretty much knew that this duel was over. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had to use the same strategy as Mai and just end up running out the turns for attempt two. Mago's water monsters are just too strong for literally anything in my deck. But a win is a win, goddammit. MVP gotta go to Hinotama and Sparks. Love y'all. Landing in... France? Our next opponent is Joey. Finally, we can get back to actually playing the game. Joey's field is similar to Tristan's, except this one is vertical, and he has a couple additions of other types of land. Right off the bat, I knew I wanted to stick to the right-hand side of the map, seeing as it has the strip of dark for my fiends, and a strip of wasteland for Metal Dragon. One thing I've learned from playing Duelist of the Roses so much is that land is pretty much everything. <laughs> if you can get your monster on like the corresponding land, you have such a better time. In a stroke of pure luck, I draw Call of the Haunted first turn, which transforms all of my monsters on the field into zombies. This rips because zombies are powered up by Dark and Wasteland, effectively doubling my land bonus ability, but it also kind of blows because even looking at the mountains will absolutely fuck me. I set up my Cyber Commander, fuse for a Cyber Soldier, and take out his Axe Raider, only to get got by Tears of the Mermaid next turn. With the power decrease from Tears of the Mermaid, he moves in close and hits me for 600 points with his 2300 Flame Sword killing my cyber soldier. Successfully luring him onto the wasteland though, I summon Air Eater at 2600, transform him into a zombie, move onto the wasteland, and deal a healthy 300 points of damage. We fuck around a bit, I fuse a Komori Dragon, hit him for 1500 points of direct damage, and then swoop in a couple turns later and finish him off with Solitude. Five down, five to go. No wait, S no, 16 to go. <laughs> fuck me. <laughs> Next up is Shoddy Morton. His deck is mainly made of rock and pyro monsters, with his map being a mix of water, dark, forest, and wasteland, all separated by a cross section of crush, a terrain that instantly destroys monsters with 1500 or more attack points. Working my way onto his half of the field, he zigs when he should have zags and moves his deck leader onto the wasteland quadrant of the map. Never did I think I would say the word quadrant in a video. <laughs> I fuse for a metal dragon on turn three and hit him directly for 2350, meaning next turn, the duel should end. Emphasis on should. So here's the deal. I was afraid that the card he played right in front of his deck leader was a trap card, which would activate next turn and kill my metal dragon. In an attempt to avoid this cruel fate, I sent in Bistro Butcher to activate the trap, hopefully clearing the way for metal dragon to attack. What I didn't expect was a fucking blast juggler whose effect is when destroyed in battle, he destroys all cards in the adjacent squares, taking not only Bistro Butcher, but also Metal Dragon, leaving me with nothing more than my dick in my hand. Thankfully, the recovery wasn't too difficult. I was able to hit him with Barox for 1380, 
I don't know why he has that weird fucking attack power, but uh, whatever. I'd also like to mention that in the process of milling cards, I accidentally made Magical Ghost, who's not only better than Barox, but could have ended the duel right there if I was actually good at the game. Regardless, I was able to secure the victory next duel using Nico Gal number two, securing her as our MVP. The most piece of shit garbage dickhead card goes to you, Blast Juggler. Jasper Tudor, aka Gramps, aka Old Krusty Fuck, is up next, who sports a deck chock full of spellcasters and all five pieces of Exodia. In the 20 years of playing this game, I actually don't think I've ever seen him get all five pieces of Exodia out. His map is one of the cooler ones in my opinion, taking the shape of what I think is a castle, Kind of just ends up looking like a jumbled pile of shit, but if you but if you squint your eyes and tilt your head, it kind of resembles a castle with like a moat around it. I start off by sending Bistro Butcher and Metal Dragon up the left side of the map in the hopes of getting there as quick as I can. I know he has a Yellow Luster Shield, which is a card that increases all of his monster's defense points by 900 points. <laughs> I've been fucked by this card on multiple occasions because what he does is throw an Illusionist Faceless Mage with a base defense of 2200 then uses that to just completely body block the door. I try to sneak through the door, man. I eventually pull a card that I didn't even know I had, but would end up being a staple in almost every future duel. Magical Labyrinth. This card randomly selects one tile of Labyrinth on the map and moves it to wherever this card is activated. It then replaces that original square of Labyrinth with a normal terrain, effectively blowing a giant hole in his castle wall. I fuse together a Zombie Warrior to clear the hole, lose Bistro Butcher to a Gravity Bind, then fuse another Zombie Warrior to fill Grandpa's other hole. <laughs> I don't know why I wrote that. <laughs> Pressing on into his dojo, he hits me with a Just Desserts for 1,500 direct points of damage. Then hits me with the old Time Seal Deluxe, a card that permanently spellbinds the strongest monster on the field, which happens to be Metal Dragon. Cutting my losses, I replace the now useless Metal Dragon with Ushi Oni, attack him directly for 1,700 from Zombie Warrior, activate Call of the Haunted, and continue to move in and corner his deck leader. With no way of escaping, my MVP Zombie Warrior brothers deal the final blow, moving us on to Bakura. Now, I hinted at this at the beginning of the video, but I had to bend the no editing my deck rule ever so slightly for this duel. See, even though the Cruel deck has the lowest deck cost of any of the starting decks, it is actually still over the minimum threshold to duel Bakura, which is 757. So, as to keep the spirit of the challenge alive, I take out one of my Air Eaters and replace him with a Fake Trap, a card that is effectively a throwaway piece of garbage. In doing so, I'm able to take on Bakura with an even more piece of shit deck than what I started with. Seriously, if you're thinking about getting into the game, don't pick the Cruel deck. It, it Just pick any anyone else is better. Just don't pick the Cruel deck. Bakura's shtick is that his map is made almost entirely of crushed terrain with these four kind of edge sections of forest. Without a land card, there's no way to get rid of the crush, meaning whichever section of forest I play a card over 1500 on is basically locked to that section. Thankfully, most of Bakura's cards are weaker and his AI is not great. So even if I can get his weaker plant cards off of the crush, I can still take them on the same as I have been. Ooh, fuck, I forgot that Forest gives fiends a power decrease. Seriously, what the fuck is up with that? Why? That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I end up pulling out some of the underdogs for this duel, hitting him first for 1300 with Dark Titan of Terror, then for another 350 from Metal Dragon. He then equipped a Dark Plant with Crush card, which I have never seen him do. This is especially weird because the deck cost for that card is 80, meaning of his 757 total deck cost, 80 of it is that one card. Crush card is a spell card that you can equip to a monster under 1,000 attack points, and when that card is destroyed in battle, it transforms all adjacent squares into crushed terrain, effectively destroying any monster that attacks it. Because Dark Titan of Terror is at 1,300 attack, this actually does end up affecting me, but it can be a pretty gnarly card. I move forward, trap him in the corner, and knock him out with one final attack from our MVP, Dark Titan of Terror. What a... A creepy looking bastard. <laughs> We're almost at the finish line for the White Rose side, finally landing in Brest to fight Henry Tudor. But I find that tiresome, so you can call me Yugi for absolutely no discernible reason. <laughs> I definitely forgot to add Air Eater back into this deck, so I'm going into this duel with the same fake trap from the last one. Yugi's map is an absolute clusterfuck, with it being a seemingly random assortment of tiles with 
no real theme. His deck is pretty close to what it was in the anime, being comprised mainly of spellcasters with a few warriors sprinkled in there. I send in Eat Gaboon and Magical Labyrinth in the hopes of boxing him in, which shockingly works pretty well. Eat Gaboon is a trap card that destroys any monster with 1500 attack or less, I think. I don't have that written down. I'm just, I thought I would explain it. As I move forward, Eat Gaboon triggers his Spellbinding Circle, which spellbinds a card for three turns. He then attacked Eat Gaboon with a Celtic Guardian, which triggers the effect of Eat Gaboon, which was already paralyzed. The AI truly never ceases to amaze me. Somehow he did not end up having a single monster card on the field, so after a few turns of tiptoeing in his summoning area, Paralyzing Potion ended up running over Curse Breaker, Shift, and Brain Control, all of which could have absolutely turned the tides of this duel. Regardless, I box him in and force a surrender. On to the final duel of the White Rose side, we face Mana Manavidin, oh, hold on. Manavadin Fablier. In my research for this video, I found out that Manadavin is actually a, a figure in Welsh mythology, which somehow dies into the War of the Roses. I don't really know. Manadavin is a reused character that we fight at the end of both sides of the campaign, but for the White Roses, we take on the one with Chakra as his deck leader. Aside from his Skull Knight counterpart, the Chakra deck is actually one of the most powerful decks in the game, and it can be a pretty fucking tough fight, even with a good deck. Trying to rush him from the start, I send out Man Eating Treasure Chest, which he counters turn two with a fucking Black Skull Dragon. I try to double team him with a Metal Dragon and a powered up King of Yami Makai, but he quickly thwarts my efforts by destroying my Metal Dragon with Sangha of Thunder. S Sangha of the Thunder. Sangha? Sangi, but he quickly thwarts my efforts by destroying my dragon with Sangha of the Thunder. In some true heart of the cards ass luck, I draw Magical Labyrinth and Fiend's Hands in the same turn, meaning I can not only set up an impenetrable defense, but I can also get rid of his Black Skull Dragon. I also way overextend and hit him for 2500 from King of Yami Makai, and luckily make it back to the darkness before he kills me. With a Labyrinth Tile blocking one of his directions, and a 3000 point King of Yami Makai blocking the other, Manadavin's AI breaks, and now it's just a game of patience. 87 turns later, and we successfully have beaten the White Rose side of Duelist of the Roses using the worst starting deck. After our epic victory over Manavadin Fablier, Chakra Edition, we are now forced to join up with the Red Rose homies and take on Kaiba and the boys. To start, we have two options, Weevil and his band of bugs in the forest, or Rex and his dinosaurs in the wasteland labyrinth thing. I, I don't really know what that's supposed to be. <laughs> Seeing as all my fiends get a power decrease on the forest, which makes up 94% of Weevil's map. We're going to start with Rex, and I'll just... We'll figure that one out later. <laughs> Seeing as he is one of the first duels we'd face in a normal new playthrough, I went into this not too worried. With the Metal Dragon Cyber Commander combo, I could be waltz around the wasteland with two cool 2650 attack monsters and movement bonus. That was until I remembered that Rex has one card in his deck that could absolutely fuck my ass. Stainstorm. Stainstorm is one of the few cards in the game that completely wipes the board of a specific monster type, in this case, machines. Luckily, he did not end up playing at this duel, and it went very smoothly overall. I blocked off one of the paths with Magical Labyrinth, Paralyzing Potion, his strongest card, Brachio Raidus, then proceeded to mill cards for Metal Dragon. Once I got both Metal Dragons out, it was just a matter of chasing down his deck leader, netting me my first Red Rose victory. Moving on to Weevil, I did not have much of a plan for this duel. As previously mentioned, the forest decreases almost all of my monsters by 500 points, while also increasing his insects by 500 points. Translation, I'm fucked. I, well, to be honest, I, I have no idea what I was doing my first attempt. I kind of just rushed in and got my shit pushed in, but I was determined to figure something out for round two. There are no labyrinth tiles on Weevil's map, meaning magical labyrinth is completely out of the question. My strongest fiend would be Ushi Oni powered up by Fiend Castle at a piss poor 2150 on the forest, and Metal Dragon is really only useful on these three plops of Wasteland. I hit him with an early Hinatama for 100 points of damage, which he followed up by sending a 2900 Kawaga Hercules to absolutely fingerfuck my man, Solitude. Thankfully, Solitude's effect spellbinds the enemy monster for three turns when destroyed in battle, allowing me to run to the other side of the map and set up some defenses. At this point, I had pretty much given up, seeing as even on Wasteland, Metal Dragon still couldn't beat his Quagga Hercules, which isn't even his strongest card. But shockingly, as I backed into the corner and started passing turns, he 
retreated and started doing the same. I know Weevil's AI mainly focuses on getting out perfectly ultimate Great Moth, but he didn't even start ditching cards for that, so I'm not totally sure what happened to break his AI, but I'll take it. Somehow using a single Hinatama and waiting 87 turns won me the duel. Thinking this would be more of a fair fight, I move on to Darkness Ruler, whose map is almost entirely made of darkness. Go figure. His deck is mainly fiend type monsters, so I figured this would be a pretty even map, and he's done. Hmm. Necromancer is up next with his low cost zombie deck. I was a little worried about this one because he can bust out some pretty beefy dudes like Pumpkin and Skelgon, but thankfully his half of the map is Wasteland, which not only powers up his zombies, but also my Metal Dragon. After trading blows for a bit, he moved his deck leader down to avoid an attack from my Zombie Dragon, then proceeded to fuse for a 3200 Skelgon and absolutely blow my balls off. However, in doing so, he left a single space open that I was able to summon Ushionian, power him up with Fiend Castle, activate Call of the Haunted for an additional 500 land bonus points, and finally Wombo Combo him into next Fucking Tuesday Necromancer, get the fuck out of here, you bald bitch. After uh, reviewing the footage, I see that he only had uh, 550 life points left, so I, I may have may have done a bit of overkill on that one. But the point stands. Fucking bald bitch. Bandit Keith is up next, and to my surprise, a total ball buster. Anytime I would try to develop a plan, and by plan I mean play Magical Labyrinth, he would counter it with goddamn magic jammer and absolutely fuck me. My first two attempts ended in defeat simply because his monsters are just way more powerful than mine, especially on the wasteland. Round three started about the same as the first two, so my spirits were looking pretty low. I summoned a beefed up Ushioni, who immediately got railed by Launcher Spider, then finally got off my magical labyrinth without triggering his magic jammer. This is where shit started to get a little funky. For whatever reason, Keith ended up running over his 2700 Launcher Spider with a card that I never ended up flipping up, so I I don't know what it was. I checked the Duelist of the Roses wiki, and it looks like the only card in his deck that is more powerful than Launcher Spider is Barrel Dragon, although I do know he also has a Machine King, which I think is equal to Launcher Spider, so it, it might have been that, but we'll never know. Whatever that card ended up being, it is always weird to me to see the enemy run over its own cards, which he did another three times. <laughs> Once with Patrol Robo, another time with a mystery card, and a third time with a different mystery card. After that, something must have gone haywire with his pathfinding skills, because once he got to the bottom left corner of the map, he kind of just stayed there. With the damage taken from an earlier Hinatama and Sparks, victory was mine in just 87 turns. Okay, hold on, I gotta get a towel. It's so fucking hot in here, Jesus Christ. <coughs> Fuck me. Moving on to... Moving on to the northernmost portion of the map, we take on Labyrinth Ruler. His map is supposed to resemble a labyrinth maze that the player must navigate in order to reach his deck leader. What it actually ends up being is just a series of brick walls and tight corridors that are really fucking annoying to deal with. This never really bothered me, and it doesn't really still, but especially compared to something like Clovis's Redux mod, seeing the maze that he made in that mod is incredible compared to whatever they did in the regular game. Aside from that, his deck has warriors, it has machines, it's got insects, it's it's just, it's just a jumbled pile of shit. The big thing we need to worry about with him is Gate Guardian, a name I'm sure you know well. I hit him turn one with Hinatama for 100 points of damage, which he immediately recovers from with 1,000 points back from Goblin Secret Remedy, meaning there's no way I can win this duel simply with Sparks. I push up the side, take out his wall shadow with King of Yami Makai, and absolutely fumble the Magical Labyrinth. I then fuse and lose Metal Dragon in the same turn to his Labyrinth tank, which I then bait into attacking Fiend's Hand, destroying it the following turn. I've used for another Metal Dragon, and just by the skin of my nuts, take out his Sangha of the Thunder. In doing so, his AI ceases to understand how the game works, and he backs himself into a corner protected only by Labyrinth Wall. My, my man, you, you could have used that to pro You know what? Never mind, I'll take it. Balking him in with Metal Dragon, he finally surrenders, moving us on to the Toon Master Chomo himself, Pegasus. Similar to Jasper Tudor, Pegasus' map loosely resembles a castle, with the interior being his toon terrain, blocked off by labyrinth walls with these kind of normal drawbridge 
things. At least I think they're supposed to be draw bridges. I really don't know. For my first attempt, after trading blows for a bit, he ends up using brain control on my air eater, hitting me directly for 2,100 points of damage, followed up by 1,150 points from his Bakuri box. This one's, this one's gonna be a doozy. Attempt two went about the same with him using brain control again to take control of my metal dragon, hitting me for 1,850, followed up by 1,000 points from Tremendous Fire, which inevitably killed me. Attempt four is where it all comes together. And, and by it, it all comes together, I mean I use sparks on turn one and then uh, ran out the clock to win. I can't remember if I mentioned this before, but Toon Terrain gives every monster a 500 point decrease, save for a handful of like Toon cards. And the cards that it doesn't give the decrease to, it gives them a 500 point increase. Meaning that something like Red Eyes Black Dragon, normally at 2400, automatically gets dropped to 1900 just for entering the field. It is some of the most bullshit, bullshit ass shit that the game has to offer, and I'm not fucking with it. So yes, I hit him with sparks on my first draw and then waited out 99 turns to beat Pegasus. And to be honest, I am not sure that there is another way to do that. Also, that motherfucker doesn't even have a rose card, so there's no point in dueling him other than that it's required. Moving on to Ishtar, whose name I think used to be Isis? We face our next to last rose duelist. Her map is largely made of crush with these wasteland blobs in the middle, all surrounded by a water path. Looking at this now, I think it might be like a volcano. I'm not totally sure, but like, you know, you got like the wasteland in the middle with the, the lava ring and the, you know, no, nothing, J just me. Sticking to the crush tiles, I bust out some of my weaker monsters for this one, starting with three-headed Guido, who immediately gets destroyed by Boulder Tortoise. Using Phantom Dewan's effect, I spellbind her Boulder Tortoise for three turns, allowing me to summon a powered up King of Yami Makai right in front of her leader, hitting her for 2,500 points of direct damage. I then send in Hinatama to block one of her summoning spaces, which she runs over with one of her face down cards. I know that this is a monster card because the enemy AI rarely, if ever, runs one of their spells into yours, even if they know it will destroy it. In an absolute Hail Mary play, I attack the face down card with my 2500 King of Yami Makai, knowing that it will either end the duel or kill him, since he will be moved on to the crush. Luckily, this card ended up being a Kiminar... Kiminar... Ari... Koz... This guy! Uh, at 700 attack points, dealing 1800 points of damage to her life points, winning me the duel. On to our final Rose Cardless Duelist, we meet up with King Richard III of England, who mistakes us for one of his allies. This is one of my favorite duels, simply because I just really like warriors, but I also like the simplicity of the map. I hit him with Hinatama turn one, then fuse for Komori Dragon in an attempt to ascend him around the mountain edge to flank him. He attacks Komori Dragon with Empress Judge, tying us both at 3,900 life points. I spellbind his 2,700 battle ox with Phantom Dewan's effect, then absolutely fuck up the Paralyzing Potion and accidentally spellbind Phantom Dewan. <laughs> no matter how many times you play Duels with Roses, you are truly never immune to being a fucking idiot. He moves forward and almost completely pins me to the corner, but with some unbelievably tight timing, I finally draw Ushioni, power him up with Fiend Castle, take out his battle ox that has absolutely been ravaging my asshole, and finally clear out some breathing room. He hits me for 1900 points from Nico Gal number two, who I then introduce to Ushioni the next turn. I bait his Empress Judge to attack Solitude on the mountains, spellbinding her for three turns, leaving her prepped and ready to fall. I follow this up by baiting some more attacks from Swamp Battle Guard, Millennium Golem, and Metal Warrior number two, allowing me to come in the following turn with Ushioni, dealing additional damage to his life points. The idea with this strategy is that if the enemy knows it can defeat a monster, i.e. it's weaker and face up, they will go for it damn near every time. This means I can throw out a monster in defense mode that I know will be destroyed, but will bring in his monsters closer to my stronger ones so I can attack them while they're still in attack mode. If the enemy knows their card will be destroyed, they'll switch it to defense mode so as to not take damage. But since they are forced by the code god to attack anything and everything, they go for it, leaving their card in attack mode. Rinse and repeat, and we eventually emerge victorious, allowing us to take on the head honcho of the White Roses, Seto. Both Seto and each version of Manavadin Fablier have the same overall map layout, with the exception of Seto's being that the middle is normal terrain. In typical Hunter fashion, I way overextend and send Solitude to his certain demise, getting his shit absolutely rocked by Judgeman on turn two. I then panic, 
use Magical Labyrinth to block his path, and summon Ushioni to take out his Mystical Horseman, dealing 850 points of damage. I set up Cyber Commander, fuse for Metal Dragon, immediately get fucked by Shadow Spell, run over Metal Dragon, and play King of Yami Makai. He uses Steel Ogre Grotto number two to body block the door, but with a little temptation from my deck leader, he moves forward, allowing me to attack him with Ushioni. He also activates Gift of the Mystical Elf, with which he recovers 1500 life points back, since, you know, it was a close one. He moves one of his face down cards forward, allowing me to attack it with Ushioni, and wouldn't you fucking know it, it's Swordsman from a Foreign Land. A card whose effect is the same as Fiend's Hand. When destroyed in battle, the opposing monster is also destroyed. The only good thing to come out of this is that I did get to deal a healthy 1800 points of damage, but I am now out my strongest monster. So, was it worth it? No. I summon the next best thing, Air Eater with Fiend Castle at 2600, and then start flying a little too close to the sun. <laughs> Sending out Karibo, I run over one of his Monster Reborns and a Curse Breaker, which unfortunately triggers his AI to get out of the loop that it was stuck in, and he hits me with his claim to fame, the Blue Eyes White Dragon. Knowing that there is nothing I can do to take out that behemoth, I send in Fiend's Hand and basically get sent back to square one. He flips up two Sword Stalkers at 3100 apiece, and then just leaves them there. I move Paralyzing Potion into position, where I will hopefully paralyze the card that is blocking his life points, allowing me to swoop in for the kill shot. Unexpectedly, uh, when his card attacks Paralyzing Potion, it uh, just doesn't move. I don't know if I'm just misremembering how that card works, but I thought that his card, when it attacks Paralyzing Potion, would move into its spot, but apparently it, it, it doesn't, and I don't know, I don't remember that being a thing. Looking back now, he got stuck in a loop, and I could have just ended it here by skipping turns until the end, but I wanted to actually try and defeat him and not just chalk it up to bad AI. So after a very hasty move, I summon Neckhunter from across the labyrinth wall and run over one of his spell cards. After doing so, he attacks Neckhunter with Judge Man, dealing 950 points of damage, giving him a commanding lead. I bite the bullet and end up attacking the paralyzed card, which turns out to be Kaiser Dragon at 2300, meaning I deal 300 points of damage to his life points. I follow that attack up with another move towards his leader, taking out another Kaiser Dragon. He moves his leader forward to avoid my attack, plays a second Judge Man, and kills Air Eater, dealing an additional 300 points of damage to me. Once again channeling the luckiest possible outcome for a duel, he leaves one space open right next to his deck leader that I am able to summon the brother of the fallen Air Eater in, hitting him for the final 2100 points of damage needed to win the duel. There's absolutely no way that the duel should have ended this way, but I will take that shit any day of the week. So now, we stand toe to toe with the final boss of the game, Manavadin Fablier, Skull Knight Edition, with his bullshit trap cards and all. As mentioned before, he and Seto share the same map, with his middle being full of Crush. He also has the same leader ability as Yugi, meaning all of my fiends get a 500 point decrease simply for being too close to his leader. This deck is truly so fucking bad, and I cannot stress that enough. We both move forward into the Crush. He uses Rai Ri. Rai. Rai Ryoku. Force. He uses Force. This card cuts my life points in half and adds those points to any monster of his. It's busted as hell, and he's got two of them. Luckily, that means he cannot move that monster onto the Crush, meaning as long as we don't leave the center ring, we're pretty safe. I activate his Mirror Force with Mechanical Snail, the guy that I have exclusively used to fuse for Metal Dragon, and this thankfully only hits him, allowing me to still summon this turn, hitting him for 880 points from Barox. I sadly lose Barox to a Gravity Bind the next turn, but to be honest, I, he wasn't really doing much to begin with. He moved back onto the Crush, allowing me to hit him for 600 points of damage from Fiend's Hand. I am really busting out all of the underdogs for this one. I move forward and summon Bistro Butcher, hitting him for 1300 points of damage, which he then avoids the next turn by moving back onto the grass. He moves back onto the Crush, which I try to capitalize with an attack from Unknown Warrior of Fiend, who unfortunately gets zapped by another Gravity Bind, draining his balls and attack points all the way down to zero. Also, he's spellbound forever. It is a real piece of shit card. <laughs> Somehow, through tiny cuts and jabs from the weakest cards in my deck, I've taken the lead. Through what can only be described as some divine ass intervention, he leaves his deck leader completely unguarded by his trap cards, and after making sure that he didn't have a second mirror force lying in wait, I wipe my whole hand, summon Air Eater for 2100, and finish the fight. 21 up, 21 down, and this challenge is finally finished. Fuck this deck 
and fuck you, Blast Juggler. Thank you all for watching. I hope I didn't waste your time today, and I really appreciate you sticking around to the end. Again, this challenge was a lot of fun, and I'm glad I got to document me overtaking England or France or whatever the fuck the story is in this game. I've been Aquasloth, you've been great, and I'll see you guys later. Take care.